Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the book of Daniel. We thank you because this book brings encouragement. It is good news to us who are discouraged. It is good news to us who are feeling your silence now. It is good news to all those loving Father who have an intention and a desire to inherit the kingdom of God. Because then we can know what the future holds. And we can know the winning side that we might align our lives with the winning side. But Lord, this moment, I'm only praying like Daniel for wisdom. I'm praying that, Lord, you will use my tongue to speak for you and for the glory of your name. So I pray that, Lord, let myself disappear as the Spirit of God takes control and that Jesus may be visualized in the speech and in the words of my utterance because I am sure, Lord, by your grace, they emanate from the word of truth and the word of light. Bless your people as they listen. Cover them with the blood of Jesus and give unto us all the anointing and the presence of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for listening to prayer because I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our subject tonight is The Man and the Beast, part one. And our text comes from Daniel chapter seven, verse one to verse seven. Now, if you are here the other day, on Sunday evening, I introduced to you the background of the book. And I made mention to you that in those times, Israel was very discouraged, disturbed, and they were not sure whether God still is supreme and all-powerful. And so the Bible tells us, as they go into the foreign land, God speaks to them again through the book of Daniel. And yesterday, I demonstrated to you how God answers their cry and how God demonstrates to them that he's still in control. As Nebuchadnezzar bows down before Daniel, as Nebuchadnezzar pays obedience to the supreme God of heaven and earth, the king of kings, the lord of lords, Nebuchadnezzar says Babylon is under the power of heaven. And so, if you are an Israelite, you would be excited, wouldn't you? In the camp, you have heard that the king bowed before Daniel. On the streets, you walk with your head extra high. Before, you are walking like this, and they would ask you, are you a Jew? You say, "Mm -hmm." I only look like one of them, but I'm not. Like Peter, they tell you, is that man your friend? And you say, "Mm -hmm, I've never seen him before. So they were walking like that. But after the experience of Daniel chapter 2, everyone was walking with his head up and they were asking him, are you a Jew? He said, yeah, the one, the brother of Daniel. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, and then they were walking majestically and they were waiting now for Babylon to go, for the Medan Persia to go, the second, the third kingdom to go, and the fourth, and then they were waiting for the last kingdom because God had promised to them that the last kingdom will be their kingdom, the kingdom of the saints, the children of God. Five years. The heaven is not even shaking. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar is even growing stronger. Ten years. He's not about to give up. Nebuchadnezzar is growing stronger. He goes for battle. He wins more territories. He adds more territories to his empire. And then remember, something had happened. Daniel was the prime minister. Before Daniel came, the Chaldeans, in Daniel chapter 2, were the lead councils of the king. They were the priests of Madok. So, when Daniel takes over, Daniel becomes the lead council of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, these guys were eating from the king. They begin to plot how they can dethrone Daniel from that position and get back into favor with the king. So, when the king begins to win more wars and the kingdom is expanding, becoming richer, they approach the king and say, now king, for sure. Talk to us. If really the God of the Israel was a great God, why would Maduk give you these victories? You, are you believing this crap of this slave of yours that your kingdom will get away and get finished? Do you think with the way we are rising, Babylon will ever go down? And Nebuchadnezzar begins to realize, because now it is 20 years. Between the book chapter 2 and chapter 3, it is 22 years. 
Nebuchadnezzar say, mm, even people are beginning to, eh, to think I was crazy. So I must reinforce and reinstate Maduk, the god of Babylon, to his original place. So he says, now we make an image of gold, head to top. This business of gold, the silver, bronze, and no, sir. Babylon, pack a last from beginning to end. And then he says, everyone must come. Because Nebuchadnezzar was making a statement that the things of Daniel are not, you can even see as the passing of time. They are not sensible. In that very experience, you know what happened. Meshach, Shadrach, and God speaks again. As he's challenged, he speaks again. Nebuchadnezzar says, ah, I made a mistake. This God must be great again. So he worships. But again, between chapter 3 and chapter 4, time passes. And, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar says, eh, this thing is not happening again. So he goes to the roof of his house and he begins to say, nah, look at how powerful I am. Look at how beautiful and how expansive my kingdom has been. I have made it by my own might. And that very moment, God sends him a message. And the Bible says, says to him, you'll go to the field and you'll be there seven years. You'll be like the beast. You'll eat like the beast. And when you realize and become humble, then you'll be reinstated. And the Bible tells us that exactly happened. And he was reinstated as a king in chapter 4. And he writes and says all the history and Nebuchadnezzar dies and other kings come and other kings come. Chapter 5, Belshazzar, the grand grandson of, uh, grand of Nebuchadnezzar takes over. It's not the actual king. The actual king is Nabonidas. But because Nabonidas did not worship Maduk, he had another god he worshipped. These Chaldeans who are also fighting with Daniel pushed him away and so he went to another place, Tema, and that's where he was. And that's why Belshazzar became the king of Babylon. That's why when Belshazzar is promising Daniel, he does not say, I'll give you the second most position. He says, I'll give you the third because above was Nabonidas, Belshazzar is number two, and then Daniel will be number three. So at that particular time, God is beginning to roll, and he rolls and he rolls. By the time we come to Daniel chapter 7, it is 49 years later. Forty-nine years later, God has not done anything. He had said Babylon would go, and Babylon is still in power. And the children of Israel that had been celebrating be, are beginning to doubt. They are beginning to wonder whether this God was real. And God needed to speak again. And so God speaks again. And the Bible says that after 49 years, God speaks to Daniel. And Daniel structures his uh, prophecy in three ways. The first part is of the lion, bear, and leopard. And the second part is for the fourth beast, and the third part is for the son of man. And in each of those sections, he begins with the word, in my night vision. And so in Daniel chapter 2, you find that he's saying, in my night vision, I saw, and he narrates. And when he comes to the fourth beast, he says, in my night vision, I saw. And when he comes to the son of man in verse 13, he says, in my night vision, I saw. And so tonight, we are going to look at this part, first part. Tomorrow, I'll share with you this second part. And the other day, I'll share this third part and also combine it with chapter 10 so that we get a picture of the son of man. In the Bible, the Bible says... In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. And the Bible says, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now, there are two words to note here. He says the four winds of heaven, the great sea. Last time I told you, four means uh, the universal scope. It means the north, south, and west, and east. And surely you can find that in the book of Zechariah, chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. In verse 1, the Bible says, Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot were red horses. With the second chariot were black horses. And with the third chariot was white horses. And with the fourth, there were horses of, uh, 
disparity. When you go to the book of Revelation, you'll find those horses, as also John makes use of them. So this here, but in verse 5, he says, And the angel answered to me, because he could not understand, and said to me, These are the four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horses is going to the north country, while the one with the white horse will be going to the southern, to the other side, and also the one with the dappled color will go to the south. And so the angel says to us that when the Bible uses four winds of heaven, it is in reference to the north, the south, and the west, and the west. And so it is in the entire scope. And so these beasts were coming from the earth, and they were universal so powers and there were empires in that nature. And the second word that we find there is that they were coming from a sea. And they were coming from a sea that was troubled. And in a book of Revelation we are caused to understand what the sea means in prophecy. Because the Bible says as the angel speaks to John about the mysterious Babylon the mother of all harrods, he says to him in the first verse, he says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bows came and talked with me, saying to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harrod who sits on many waters. And the word many waters is almost like seas. And so in verse 15, he explains what this means because John could not understand. Then the Bible says, then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harrod sits are people's multitudes, nations, and tongues. In other words, when you come to the Bible and the description of a beast coming out of water, it is a description of a beast coming out of the multitude of people or within the populated area. And when you go to the book of Revelation, if you want to study, you also find the same beast coming from water and another one coming from the earth. The earth symbolizes a place where there are not many people. But these beasts were coming up from the water, and that means there were empires that were rising out of where people were. And so John said, Daniel says to us, and four great beasts came up from the sea, which, whereby each one of them was different from the other. And you know, it's interesting to note, because in Babylonian uh, astrology and Babylonian mythology, animals symbolized upcoming historical events. And by coincidence or by design, God chooses animals to speak to Daniel and re-emphasize his earlier commitment to Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter 2. And so he does not choose animals by accident, but he chooses them because even in the Babylonian mythology, animals represented historical events that would unfold. For example, even in the book of Ezekiel, if you notice, as I spoke to you last time, verse, chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says, also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had one, the face of a man, and then they had the face of the lion, the face of the eagle, and the face of the cattle. Because in the ancient way of description, animals represented kind of dominion and kingdoms. And so the author and the the, the Bible in Daniel uses animals because they were rightful descriptions of historical events. And since Daniel is dealing with the history of the world, he chooses by the grace of God through inspiration and vision to also describe these kingdoms by animals. But there's something strange about these animals. These animals, if you read and you had the scriptures, my brother read it, they were a lion with eagle's wings. And then you had a bear with four heads and eagle's wings. And then, sorry, the leopard. And then you had a bear. Now, this is very strange because in the Bible, according to the biblical account and the creation experience, when you read the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 21, the Bible says, So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind. And every winged bird according to its And God saw that it was good. So everything God created was according to his kind. For example, again, when you read verse 24, then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And so it was. Verse 25 again, it says, and God said, 
And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, a cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And that's why God insisted that it is not a good practice for people to mix kinds. Because it has a spiritual message. Any mixture is a dilution of what God has said. That's why the Bible says you shall not add on to the words of God. Because when you add, you mix your words with God's words. And so the Bible says, according to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 19, if you read, God gives the children of Israel a statute. He says to them, you shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind. Another kind. In fact, he says you shall not sow in your garden mixture. Some of you might say that is harsh. Eh? Agriculturist. Eh? This is dot com. Take here, add here. Genetic modification, right? Yeah. Just modify. You see, when you add to another kind, in a spiritual sense, it is a corruption. And that's why when God is describing these powers, he describes them as a mixture. Why? Because they were intended originally to have promoted the will of God. But when you look at through history, the empires oppress God and they seek to oppress the will of God. So though they were meant to be God's... Uh, Agents, because remember Daniel told us, you are great. You remove kings and you set up kings. So it is God who gives kingdom. God gives authority. God gives power. But when he gives man power, man uses that power to oppose God and oppose his will. In so doing, he has mixed what is divine with what is human. And when we come later tomorrow, you will see how this is important. Because you see a beast which tries to mix without any shame. And so the Bible says to us in Ephesians 6, 12, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in the present age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What the Bible says that the powers of the earth, instead of promoting godly values and godly purposes, they are used by the power of the enemy to instead confound the wisdom of God, to distract the will of God, and to oppose the will of God. And so God describes through history what would happen. And that's why since the people are in Babylon, God is telling them that that power which should have been on for the purpose of God is now turning to oppress you. Not only that, the next power will do so. The other power will do so. And the other power will do so. For example, there is a story when Alexander the Great came to, to Jerusalem. He wanted to clear them. So he came with his march, army and he was marching towards Jerusalem. And the Jews saw him from afar and they knew they were finished because they have heard of what he has done. So the high priest and the priest went ahead of the people and they met Alexander the Great. He said, sir, you are Alexander the Great? He said, sure. Who are you? I said, we have heard a lot about you. You are a tough man, powerful, majesty. But can we show you something? They took him to the temple, opened before him the book of Daniel, and told him, you see, God already knew you would come. So instead of hurting us, we are here, we are ready, we knew you were coming. And uh, instead of uh, Alexander becoming grievous and tough, he sat for a cup of juice. And that's why he never attacked so much. Uh, the people until the Hellenization came. And so Daniel brings to our attention that we are going to face powers with one express intention to oppose the will of God. And so in Daniel chapter 4, Daniel says the first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched until the wings were plucked off and this lion stood up 
and was lifted up onto the earth and made to stand with two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Now this power, according to the Babylonian archive and the archaeological studies that come, Babylonian art always depicted winged lions as a symbol for the Babylonian empire. In fact, when you go to great many wings, decorated the cities and the roads of Babylon. And so when God chooses the lion with the wings, is not mistaken. Even Nebuchadnezzar is spoken of in the book of Daniel with those same effect. When you read the book of Jeremiah 49 verse 19, when God is giving um, a judgment against Ammon, and Edom, he says the following, he says to them, I'm sending Nebuchadnezzar, he's coming. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the flood plain of the Jordan against the dwelling place of the strong, but I will suddenly make him run away from her. And then in verse 22, he again talks about Nebuchadnezzar in these words. He says, behold, he shall come up and fly like the eagle. So again, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is described as a lion and as an eagle. That is why God chooses a lion with an eagle as the rightful description of the empire that will first come or becomes the starting point. Just like the gold, here also the lion represents the empire. And then if you read the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 30, the Bible says, A lion! which is mighty among beasts and does not turn away from any. A lion. That's why the Bible says, your adversary, the devil, is like a lowering, seeking whoever to never underestimate the power of a lion. That's why Jesus is called the lion of? Mm -hmm. Lions are lions, eh? The devil is a lion, Jesus is a lion. So which lion are you loyal to? All of them want you. You remember the stone yesterday? Even when you don't believe Jesus, he will also crush you. So it is either the same. You are crushed by the devil or you are crushed by, by Jesus. And so the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible says Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives. And in their death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than. And so when the Bible uses lion and eagle, it is speaking to two profound qualities about that kingdom. That kingdom must have been strong. That's why it was the head of God. It must have been swift. Eh? When they come against you, you... In fact, by the way, let me tell you, if you are a king of any kingdom close to Nebuchadnezzar and you had a rumor that his chariots are coming, if you don't have a grave, you make one. In the life of Israel, when Nebuchadnezzar had just taken over, he, he put this guy, Zedekiah, and um, uh, Joachim and the, the son Joachim came in and then he put them, then he had asked them to pay some money as a tribute to show that they are royal to him. So after a while they said we are not paying. Nebuchadnezzar said what have they said? They are not paying. Okay. He came. He came, they thought they were strong. So this king reaches out to Egypt. He had thought that Egypt would come to his aid. He calls out to Egypt and Egypt is not coming and so is bare. Nebuchadnezzar crashes and takes this king and he takes him to Babylon and he says to him, he takes the first child of his, he smashes the child and the child is dead. And then he, tells, he kills the other kids and then he tells the king that would be the last thing you will see and so he got the iron coal and put it in his eyes and all of them went. So he lived there after blind. That is Nebuchadnezzar, you never joke with him. That's why I told you yesterday, a man of that caliber bowing before 21 year old is not a simple thing. And so the Bible says to us that the lion, you know, this lion symbolizes strength, but also the eagle's wings will symbolize swiftness with which it will conquer. But then look at verse 5. The Bible says, and suddenly another beast a second like a bear. 
It was raised up on one side and three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour the flesh as much as possible. A bear. It is raised at one side. When we get to the book of uh, Daniel chapter 8, it will be represented as a ram with two horns, one higher than the other. Why? Because there were two kingdoms within one empire. You had the Meds and the Persians. The Meds in the beginning were the superior and the Persians were subordinate. But under King Cyrus, the Meds, the Persians, took over and defeated the Meds and the Persians became the king. That is why they say one side is higher than the other. Because one serves the other. And so we are told, according to the scripture, that this bear is cruel. In fact, when you look at 2 Samuel 17 verse 8, the Bible says, For, said Ushai, you know your father and his men, that they are mighty men, and they are enraged in their minds, like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. Very cruel. Ravenous. In fact, when you read Proverbs 28 verse 15, the Bible says, like a roaring lion, a charging bear is a wicked ruler over poor people. When a, a ruler is wicked and you are poor, <laughs> you, you, you know when a, a ruler is wicked and you are poor, you have nothing to do. It's like, you know, quarreling with a strong man. The best you can do is at least to blow a whistle. But you cannot do anything. When you go, you say, look at his big head. But the man is there with his big head and he's sitting on you with a small one. So there is nothing, the best you can do is to abuse him. But when a man is powerful and wicked, it's like a charging bear over your life. He keeps coming and keeps coming. And so the Bible seems to suggest that a bear like a lion is also ravenous and also disturbing. In Amos 5.19, the Bible says, it will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and lo and behold, there was the serpent, that old dragon, that old dragon called the devil. You are running away from Babylon, you land into Medopasia. You are running away from Medopasia, you land into the dragon, the devil himself, poor. Leave that for another day. Uh, Donald Kagan says this about the Persian kingdom. He says, the Persian empire had been created in a single generation by Cyrus the Great. In 559 BC, he came to the throne of Persia, then a small kingdom, well to the east of the lower Mesopotamian valley, and he unified Persia under his rule, made an alliance with Babylonia, and led a successful rebellion towards the north against the Medes, who were the overlords of Persia. In succeeding years, he expanded his empire in all directions, in the process defeating Crossus and occupying Lydia, and you can get that from the book called The Western Heritage, page 59. That is made in Persia. Cyrus the Great. And if you read the book of Isaiah, Cyrus had been prophesied and given in prophecy by Isaiah that God would raise up a man and he called his name Cyrus. So even before Cyrus came, God had already said he would come. And he came. And he unified Persia. And he made sure Persia overseas maids. But when he came and they conquered Babylon... It was the maid who began the reign. That was Darius, of whom we know that Daniel was cast in the lion's den. Cyrus was on the other side, still conquering. And so he put Darius as a governor over Babylon after it had fallen. And when you look at the, 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 the bear, we are told that it has three ribs in its teeth. And this symbolizes the power that maids and Persians had to uproot in order for it to become an empire. And history tells us that the three ribs represent the three main conquests of the Persians. And that is Lydia, Babylonia, and Egypt. Remember, Egypt was the first superpower, if you would say, during the days of Joseph. It continued so. And then after that... Lydia or Assyria also became a superpower that took northern Israel. And after Assyria, 
Babylon came under the, 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 the power of Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar, and he also became a living empire. So these three were very powerful powers by then. And the Medes and Persia, in order to gain control, had to uproot the Lydians and the Babylonians and the Egyptians. And so that's why God says that this power will have to undo three profound powers if it is ever going to become a world power. And so this second beast which is represented by the bear is truly Med and Persia. Look at how the Jews describe Med and Persia. In one of their books, they said, Persians eat and drink like the bear, have hair like the bear, are agitated like the bear. In another Talmud book, there is a passage that says that the guardian angel of the Persians is called the bear of Daniel. So the bear is a good description of the Persian kingdom. And so as the lion describes Babylon, God again gives the very right animal that can describe the second empire, which is the Medes and the Persians. And then Daniel tells us, again I was still watching. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird, the beast also, and four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now, it's very interesting because in the book of Habakkuk, you find a combination of eagle and leopard, and this is how it is written. The Bible says there are horses also, about these uh, Grecian people, are swiftier than leopards, and more fierce than the evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as eagles that hastens to eat. And so when the Bible uses leopards and eagle, it is speaking to the swiftness of the empire. And if you know that Alexander the Great conquered the world in the shortest possible time. And also died as the youngest king. In fact, the four heads represent and continues to show the multiplied dominion. The idea that the power will have a universal sweep of dominion across the entire world. And also the number four symbolizes totality and universality as the four winds of heaven symbolizes the entire expanse. This man, this young man, uh, Alexander the Great, under the Greek Empire, conquered the entire world. And you know, it's very interesting because the kingdom is characterized by the rapidity and the universality. In fact, when you note, the third kingdom is the only kingdom to which dominion is given. The first kingdom, which is the lion, gets a heart of man. And that describes the time Nebuchadnezzar was thrown into the beast and became like a beast. And he was humbled. And by the time he came out, he had a heart that was submissive to God. And so he was humbled and given a heart like a man. And so Babylon is described as a state in which it will also bow down before God at an appointed time. But also the Medes and Persia, we are told, they received a, a command and they said they should go forth and devour much flesh. For them, they should go and kill, kill people. But then to this leopard, the Bible says, to him was given dominion. Power to dominate. Now, Greece dominated for sure. Because Greek did not only conquer territories. They conquered places with culture. Greeks were so powerful that even the Jews who were never movable when it comes to their culture, they were pushed that their Bible, which was the Holy Bible written in Hebrew, had to be translated into Greek. Which we call the Septuagint. Because everyone was speaking Greek. When Jesus came, he had no choice but to speak Greek. <laughs> this guy, wherever he went, he went with soldiers and they married women. And they began to teach those people the language, the Greek language. And every year they learned Greek language, they learned the culture. And so if you study, they will tell you what they call Hellenization. Hellenistic, eh? It simply means being influenced by the Greek culture and tapping into the Greek culture. This Greek power dominated the world, but not only in dominance in first power is concerned, but they dominated the entire world even with culture. 
Everywhere people were speaking Greek like the English did. To the extent that I'm speaking to you in... Is it Uganda? I have to speak to you in... Why? Because we were colonized by... I'm not putting on a tie. Is it African? I'm a humble servant of my colonizers. Hmm? I speak their language. I dress like them. Forgive me, O oh Lord, but since these are earthly things, I am sure my robe in heaven is prepared, so I will not have this one. I have a robe of righteousness, so this one has no thing. I can put on anything on the outside, because on the inside, Jesus has given me a robe of righteousness, and I am sparkling. Can I show you? God bless these people. God bless these people. And then the Bible says, and there was a fourth beast. And the Bible says, and this, I, I, after this, I saw in the night vision. Now he has gone into the second phase. He says, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. It is not only strong, but exceedingly. And then he says, it had a huge iron teeth. I don't know how that teeth was, eh? but it was huge. In fact, when you see it before it bites you, you are finished. You are already dead, isn't it? It had a huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trembling and the residue with its feet, wherever it went, it trembled and... It's like being told that Julius Caesar is coming. And then the Bible says, hmm, it was so different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Hmm. You know, I was reading the Bible. I, when you read this passage of Daniel, there is nothing that disturbed Daniel. The first kingdom was okay. Daniel saw the beast of a lion with wings. He said, that is okay. The Bible says he saw the bear. He said, ah, the, the bear has his dibs. That is fine. It is he saw the leopard with four heads. and He said, mama, that is okay. But then when he saw the fourth one, he, the Bible says he lost strength. When he went to God, he did not ask about the first beast, the second beast. The, in fact, Daniel says, I went to this man who, and I said to him, I want to know about this fourth thing. <laughs> This fourth beast is terrible. It, it, it talk to me. The other ones, I'm not afraid. I have seen a lion. I've seen a bear. I've seen a leopard. But this one has no name. It is strange. It has horns. It, in the book of Revelation, you'll find this animal has four heads. It includes the bear. It includes lion. It includes leopard. It includes everything. And the Bible says, hmm, it, 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 this is very interesting. Now let me tell you, if you ever want to understand the book of Daniel. Chapter 2 is the introduction, but it's the outline. Out of that outline, God, through Daniel, adds pieces. Eh? He elaborates, he elaborates, he elaborates. In chapter 2, there are four kingdoms and the fifth which is in the fourth. In chapter 7, there are four kingdoms and as we'll show tomorrow, there is another kingdom inside the kingdom of the fourth. And when you go to chapter 8, because Babylon has fallen, there are two. That is the Medes and Persia and the Greeks. And again, there is that Kawanu, a Kasimoro one, inside the fourth. Mm -hmm. When you go to chapter 11, again, the same fourth one, the fifth one. Again, also is it there. For it, it is everywhere. It is in chapter 2 as the clay and the iron. Religious, political. It is in chapter 7 as the carito horn. It is in chapter 8 as the carito horn that comes out out of the four. It is in chapter 10 and 11 as the king of the north. Uh -huh. It is in chapter 12 as the conclusion of the matter. So in the entire book, the main focus is on this thing called the fourth beast and the small beast inside the fourth. That's why even in Daniel chapter 2, it occupied the highest space.
from Daniel chapter 2, verse 40 to 43. Others were saying gold and I finished. But when they came to describe, they said it was big. If you, in fact, it is here, chapter 40 alone is very long. The Bible says, and the fourth kingdom in chapter 2 shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like that, the, 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 that the kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Now look at Daniel chapter 7 and see the comparison in terms of language. The Bible says, And the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It has had a huge iron teeth and it had breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. Surely this beast which is here, the fourth, is similar to the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 2, which is consistent. Because what God is doing in Daniel chapter 7 is trying to reassure his people that he was not wrong when he gave Daniel chapter 2. So he gives Daniel chapter 7 to reawaken and reassure his people that God is still on course. Even if Babylon has not yet fallen, it is going to fall. And sure, a few years, uh, in chapter 7, by the time Daniel was speaking in the first year of Belshazzar, it only took a few more years and Babylon fell. And Daniel at 80 years, close to 90 so the new kingdom come in. He had been patient for all that while, 70 years of waiting. Before he saw one empire change. But God gave him a privilege that he saw. But then in the book as it closes in chapter 12, the Bible says to him, God said to him, Daniel, close up the book and seal it because it pertains to issues of the end. For you, you will die and sleep. And Daniel said, thank you, but at least I've seen one of them go. Brother Bitamazire will see three more go or four. And then those who live before the other one actualizes its real true power will also see it go when Jesus comes because the Bible says not all of us will sleep. The trumpet shall sound. The archangels shall sound and the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise up and we'll meet up those of us who are waiting and are alive when Jesus comes. we we'll meet up together in the clouds and hallelujah, glory to God. we we'll go with our Savior for a thousand years. So if you are still alive and you are close to my grave, you must give way. Because the way I will listen to the voice of my maker and my Savior, I will not listen more than it. He will speak once, I will listen twice. And so clearly, without stretching the margin, the book of Daniel, chapter 2 and chapter 7, speaks about the same thing. The only thing is that chapter 7 adds a little content about the image feet by bringing to us more information about what happens here. And so the Bible says both cover the same span that is from Babylon to the end of human history. Both evoke the same kingdoms represented symbolically by metal in chapter 2 and by beasts in chapter 7. And therefore, if we read chapter 7, we must read it in line with chapter 2 for us to make good comparison. And in that sense, I will like to summarize it this way. That surely, the head of gold is represented by the lion with wings. And they also the silver, the maids and pages, represent the bear. And the bronze will represent the Leopard with four wings attached to it, and finally the iron represents that ugly thing that we will discuss tomorrow. So in terms of structure, the book of Daniel from now onwards is aligned in this way. Daniel chapter 2 gives us a vision from 31 to 35, and then Daniel is given an explanation. Daniel chapter 7 from 1 to 14 gives us the vision, and Daniel chapter 15 to 27 explains because God gives the explanation. He does not leave it for man to explain. He gives the explanation. In Daniel chapter 8 and 9, the vision runs from 1 to 12, and the explanation runs from 13 to 9, 24 up to 27. And in Daniel chapter 10 to 12, the vision runs from 11.2 to 12.4 to and then the explanation runs from 12.5 to 13. And so there are four very strong visions there that can help us to appreciate the Bible and the things that pertain to the end of the world. 
Now, some of you will say, but pastor, we have heard these things over and over again. I have a scripture for you because Philippians chapter 3 verse 1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. It is important to remind ourselves of these things. Because they pertain to the end of time. In fact, in 2 Peter, uh, first chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says, Peter says, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off this tent just as my Lord Jesus has shown and in verse 19, he says, we have a sure word of prophecy. And that's why I tell you, Peter was not speaking out of abstract. Peter was saying, I'm a living testimony. Because God has clearly told me how I'm going to die. That's why you don't shake me. When you told Peter, come here, I will kill you, he says, he went. And when he was about to be killed, they took him and they were going to nail him like Jesus. And he asked them of one thing. He said, I'm not refuting. I am ready. Because the Lord showed me. In John, chapter, the last chapter, God showed him I will die. He said to him, like a baby, when you're a baby, they dressed you up. When you get old, they will also do the same. So they dress up Peter. And as they're about to crucify him, he says, wait a minute. Just do me one good favor. Just don't crucify me as Jesus, my Lord. Just crucify me upside down. Because I'm lower than my master. And they did that. And he died. He met death with courage because God had shown him. Prophecy serves to tell us what is coming so that when it comes, we meet it with courage and with boldness. That's why Paul says, do not despise prophecy. Because therein is your power. In fact, he says, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. I am dying but I'll make sure I tell you that you should be reminded. The prophecy is certain and the interpretation is sure. And so I will say to you, David says, God has spoken once, twice I have heard. And what have you heard? What have you heard? <laughs> The book of Daniel speaks one thing. Power belongs to God. 